Good evening. Welcome to worship. I would invite you at this time to stand with me for the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us all and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. 
call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Well, good evening again. Welcome to Abiding Presence Lutheran Church, a place of grace where all are welcome. Our mission is to seek God and serve others. Welcome to those who are worshiping online, as well as those who are here in person. Thank you for making your registration on APLC.org. Um, next week's worship reservations will open up on Monday. I'm sorry to announce our annual trunk retreat event has been canceled. This decision was made after the CDC put out guidance considering events like that to be very high risk. So um, we encourage you strongly to, to go out and buy your favorite candy and enjoy it um, in the comfort of your home. I, uh, let's see, coming up this Reformation Sunday on October 25th, you're all invited to a bring your own picnic gathering. Come enjoy, it'll be a beautiful day outside. We'll have fellowship in the outdoor chapel area from 4 to 6 p.m. Please bring all your own food, drinks, and feel free to use our picnic tables here or to create your own space by bringing blankets from home and chairs. There's going to be pumpkins to decorate. There will be a family activity to do together and music to enjoy for everyone. We hope to see you there. After worship this evening and also on Sunday, feel free to join myself and Pastor Steve in the outdoor chapel just across the parking lot for conversation and fellowship. We'd love to see you, to check in, um, see how you're doing, see how things are going for you. Um, so now let us turn our hearts and minds to the hearing of God's word. The first reading is a reading from Isaiah, chapter 25, beginning at verse 1. O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more, it will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you, for you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm, and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on, the, on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he may save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Word of God, word of life.
The second reading is a reading from Philippians, beginning at chapter 3, verse 17. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is in the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I, I love and long for, my joy and crown stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Eudia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel. Together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Word of God, word of life. Well, good evening, friends. It's great to be here with y'all. And today in the letter that we just heard from the Apostle Paul, he talks about imitating. And, and that's kind of a big word, but imitating basically just means like copying or acting like, right? Um, so I just want to play a quick game with all the kids here and all the former kids here as well. And this might be a little uncomfortable, but I hope you'll bear with me. This game is one you might be familiar with. It's called Simon Says. All right, so you know how this game works probably. I'm not gonna go in depth with the rules, but you have to make sure you do what Simon says and not what Simon doesn't say. All right, so Simon Says, touch your forehead. Simon Says, put your right arm in the air. Simon Says, put your left arm in the air. Put both your arms down. Oh. Simon didn't say, well, most of you did a great job. <laughs> That's as much as we're going to play right now. But um, so we're, yeah, like I said, that we're going to hear about imitating. And Paul's going to write to the church in, the, in Philippi, and he's asking them to imitate, to act like, to copy people that act like Jesus, who copied Jesus. And what that means and what that looks like is loving each other the way that Jesus loves us. And acting like Jesus and being true and honorable and just and pure and pleasing and worthy of praise. So would you all pray with me? Dear Jesus, please help us to copy you, to imitate you, and to do the sort of things in the world that you would have us do. In your name we pray. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. 
He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized the slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of our Lord. Please take seats. I hope you'll excuse my departure from the Gospel of Matthew in today's sermon. Even though we now get a break from the vineyard where we've been spending the last couple of weeks, we have also been dwelling in the epistle to the church in Philippi for the past month. And... Today's reading really sparked some thoughts for me. One of the best teachers I ever had was a college professor who taught a course on how to teach students with diverse learning needs. She also just had great life advice. One class period I'll never forget, she told our class about the importance of role models. She told us to write down the names of three or four people who we wanted to emulate as teachers. At the time, I wasn't unfamiliar with the concept of role models. I just hadn't spent a lot of time in my life thinking specifically about who my role models were or should be. Um, so I took the opportunity, looking back over my life, thinking over the people who had really inspired me, who I most respected and admired in the world, supervisors who'd invested in my growth, teachers who had sparked my imagination. I wonder, who are your role models? Who are those people for you? As I left college and started working, this one activity really stuck with me. It helped me to build a habit of asking myself questions like, how would Monty organize this class? Or what would Kristen do in this tough situation? And you know, it's funny, outside of this conscious process of imitating role models, I've occasionally had moments in my life where I suddenly realize that I'm using a phrase or saying or doing a particular thing that makes me wonder, like, where did this come from? Why am I doing this thing? Why am I saying this phrase? And I'll think back and realize that I just unconsciously picked it up from someone that I knew. Like, the way that I say, does that make sense after I explain things to people, just the way my boss used to do that to me, or the way that I respond to people by saying, outstanding, like my first sergeant used to say at Fort Hood. Perhaps this very human tendency to look to and imitate others as a model and example helps explain the Christian phenomenon of canonized saints. I realize that as Lutherans, we have historically de-emphasized the idea of formal sainthood. But let's be honest, that it doesn't keep us from lifting up our own canon of, if not saints, those whose example should be followed. Martin Luther, Johann Sebastian Bach, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Rick Steves, I'm sure there's others. In our epistle reading today, Paul asks the Philippians to imitate him. But we see in the larger canon of Paul's writings that he doesn't consider himself the end point in this imitation game. He asks the Corinthians to imitate him too, but only insofar as Paul himself imitates Christ. Ultimately, what Paul's asking us 
of us here is to be Christ-like, to be conformed to the body of Christ's glory, to be of the same mind of the Lord, standing firm. Paul has a warning and a promise for the church in Philippi. The warning is this. We do well to think carefully about who we imitate. Because I'm pretty sure we follow role models, whether we're aware of it or not, and not every role model is a good one. Paul tells us that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. We live in a world where sin is very present. Contrary to the example we have in Christ of self-giving love on the cross, there are forces in this world seeking destruction. There are forces that would tear apart communities who have no regard for the lives of the most vulnerable among us, forces that have no interest in protecting God's creation and the wonderful life it sustains. Their only concern is their appetite. Without considering the consequences to people and the world around them, these forces seek after unethical profits, power, pleasure, even celebrating their shameful actions. Their concerns are earthly. An idea which resonates with our gospel reading today as Matthew writes, one tending to his farm and one to his business, ignoring the invitation to the wedding feast of God. Paul isn't afraid to acknowledge the reality and presence of sin in our world. The tough part about this is that it makes me wonder how I participate in these forces of destruction that are larger than any of us. The ways I've internalized and mimicked destructive or toxic relationship patterns that I have either instigated myself or picked up unconsciously from the people around me, how I might perpetuate the brokenness in our fallen world rather than work for healing and reconciliation. Paul is well acquainted with these destructive forces. He writes this letter from prison, possibly in Rome or Ephesus. It's hard to make a comparison to the brutality of Roman prison but I know this pandemic has left many of us feeling somewhat imprisoned in our own homes. And despite Paul's dire circumstances, the tone of this letter is undeniably hopeful. Even As if even in the midst of a broken world and imminent danger, we, the citizens of heaven, can still expect the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is near. Rejoice in the Lord. Christ, our Lord, has power over all things and will transform our body of humiliation, our human lowliness, our existence in this fallen world of sin and brokenness into the body of Christ's glory. This is our promise in Jesus. We are already citizens of heaven. And as we struggle together as co-workers for the gospel in prisons and in pandemics, we know that Christ ultimately has the power of transformation and that we are ceaselessly being drawn to Christ. This conforming to Christ's glory, this nearness to the Lord, brings us the peace of God, says Paul. And, for just a brief moment, in the middle of this beautiful theological prose, Paul reminds us of the very present and personal implications of what he's saying. We know almost nothing about Euodia and Syntyche. The two women Paul mentions. Even the idea that there's conflict between them is only implied. We can conjecture that the fact they're named here by Paul means that they were central figures in the Philippian church. Paul speaks, excuse me, Paul speaks very highly of them both, writing that they struggled beside him in the work of the gospel. They are co-workers with Paul. He urges them to be of the same mind in the Lord. You see, even as fellow workers in our cause, struggling in the work of the gospel, we will encounter disunity and conflict. And in our society today, wow, does it feel like there is plenty of strife and conflict to go around. We live in a world of zero-sum games and scorched earth, depersonalized dialogue in the void of the internet. You know this. It goes around in posts and comments, retweets. It can seem like the sick mirror maze of imitating the worst in each other. It feels like the world is full of Euodias and Syntyches, hardworking, well-intentioned citizens of heaven who still find themselves at odds. How can Paul possibly write about the peace of God here 
Is this peace of God even available to us in 2020? Sometimes peace sounds like a totally foreign concept these days. But this peace of God promised here is not the static, numbing, passive peace offered by the world. It's a peace that guards hearts and minds. It's a peace that is found in struggling in the work of the gospel. It's a peace that is helped by community. This peace knows public gentleness. It's found in nearness to the Lord. It does not heed the voices of worry and anxiety, but raises requests to God with thanksgiving and gratitude. It's a peace that is found in doing the things we have learned and received and heard and seen, not only from Paul, but also from Euodia and Syntyche, and Clement and Augustine, and Harriet and Rosa, and Desmond and Martin, and generations upon generations of faithful people of God struggling in the work of the gospel, always imperfectly, yet as loyal citizens of heaven, being continually conformed into the glory of Christ. And maybe, maybe we can tap into some of this peace from God by looking to the example of those who have come before us. Not as a way of earning God's love or salvation, these are already our inheritance as citizens of the commonwealth of heaven. But I know that I sure find peace in remembering that I'm not alone, that others have struggled before me in this work of the gospel for generations and generations. And so I wonder if, with apologies to the Apostle Paul, instead of thinking whatever is true, whatever is noble, maybe it's more pragmatic to think about whoever. Think about these people. Whoever is true, like Sojourner Truth. Whoever is honorable, like Oscar Romero. Whoever is just, like Susan B. Anthony. Whoever is pure, like Fred Rogers. Whoever is pleasing, like Carol Burnett. Whoever is commendable, like Wilma Rudolph. If there is anyone excellent like Frederick Douglass, if there is anyone worthy of praise like Dorothy Day, think about these fallen yet faithful people, these broken yet beautiful people, these who have struggled and fallen short and kept seeking after the good news of God's salvation for the world. And the peace of God will be with us. Amen.
Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious host, fill your church with a spirit of joyous hospitality. We pray for bishops, teachers, church leaders, and all children of God as they invite others to your table of boundless grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as creation waits with eager longing for redemption, protect your creatures that are mistreated. Restore valleys, mountains and pastures, still and running waters, and those areas affected by wildfires, hurricanes, and other natural disasters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as you set a table in the presence of enemies, so bless the efforts of diplomats, international peace workers, and world leaders who navigate conflict. May they proceed with dialogue and understanding so that justice and peace prevails. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious host, we pray that the plague of the coronavirus will subside, that all who are sick with the virus be healed, and that people living with fear be comforted. Let your gentleness be known among those who are weary or ill, especially Scott and Becky Jones, Michelle Amerks, the family of Trey DeLoach on his passing, Todd Erickson, Lene Sorensen, Becky Benish, Gerald Pruitt, and we ask for prayers of thanksgiving for Mandy and Caleb Ham on the birth of their daughter, May Lee as well as those intentions we say in our hearts or out loud. Strengthen doctors, medical care workers, and caretakers who see to their needs. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious host, when we are quick to judge outward appearance, remind us how you clothe all in your mercy. We pray for ministries that provide needed clothing and other personal care assistance in this community, such as Haven for Hope, the San Antonio Children's Shelter, and all ministries supported by our congregation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious host, as we remember those who have died and are gathered at the heavenly banquet, comfort us with your presence. Assure us of your peace at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please, at a distance, share Christ's peace with one another. I invite you to be seated. Paul reminds us not to worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known to God. Your giving empowers this church to imitate Christ's work in the world and struggle together in the work of the gospel. We hope that your giving is not from a place of worry 
but from a place of thanksgiving and rejoicing and peace. Thank you for your continued support. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, and it's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. All is made ready and all are welcome to taste and see that God is good. At this time, I invite you to take the wafer out of your bag, place it in your hands, and we will commune together. This is the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. Amen. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now receive the blessing. Mother in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen.
Be at peace. Christ is with you.